Intolerance, 1916, another D.W. Griffith movie, silent film that weaves together four distinct stories set in different historic periods, all linked by the theme of intolerance and human suffering. The first one is the modern story, which is 20th century America, about a young couple who are torn apart by societal forces. Number two, the Judean story in first century A.D., is the conflict between the Pharisees and Christ and the crucifixion of Christ. Number three is the French story about 16th century France, about St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre in 1572 when the Catholics slaughtered thousands of Huguenots. The fourth, the Babylonian story of 539 BC, is the fall of the Babylonian Empire to Cyrus the Great of Persia. And tying all these stories together is a eternal mother rocking her cradle, which represents the eternal nature of these struggles. Quite frankly, folks, it was a struggle. Talk about struggles, it was a struggle for me to watch this film. This was a heavy well, let's just load. tell them, this, uh, this picture is three hours and 47 minutes. Now that's tough for any modern audience, obviously with Horizon and Costner's movie. People were going, I'm not going to go see that, look how long it is. Well, this is not only four different stories that you have to keep track of, you can't go get a, a glass of soda and come back because you won't no, know what the hell exactly. is going on. And also, it's three hours and 47 minutes of reading, you know, subtitles. Reading title cards. Right. It's, 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 it's a toughie. Three, two, one. Hmm, interesting. <laughs> the time. Yeah, the, yeah, the time. time. Exactly. I get it. I, I get it. Clock. She's getting I'm my drawings I'm knowing him so now. well lately that I can actually tell what his pictures are. Yes, because this took a lot of time, folks. This was this Who's was you? this was tough. This was a little bit of a snoozer for me um, because I, literally I did fall asleep a couple of times and had to get up and. You too, huh? It's like I was like four or five times. Yeah. Like it well, you me... don't watch it when you're in bed under the covers. That's not a good thing. You have to sit up straight. So it has four four stages and acts. Mm -hmm. yes. They all weave back and forth. It's not like they go one whole act, the second whole act. So they're going back and forth and back and forth mm -hmm. so that it's a time along. And uh, the one thing about it is Christ, you think, would be the most violent one to see Christ crucified, but actually it wasn't. No. It was the French one. Yes. And they were like really boring people and sticking knives through their hearts. And it was, you think back in the t days, and we talked about it with other silent movies, that people were, sh you know, this, they didn't see stuff this like this. This was shocking. This. And in some cases, people would either walk out or get like physically sick. Yeah, exactly. Because of the, the violence involved. Exactly. I mean, they weren't used to watching it. Like back then, it was, it was really in impactful. And I think he got carried away a little bit with it because he wanted people to forget about Birth of a Nation. So he wanted to show the benevolence towards mankind with the woman rocking the cradle and how it was all linked together. And there was something funny about it. Every time they showed the woman rocking the cradle, did you notice the three figures in the background that yes, were shadowy? I didn't get that, though. And there's no way to find out about it. And I think that it was representative of the other stories. Since we were on one story, the other three stories were waiting to come back. That was hmm. just my thought. Interesting interpretation. I, it is. It's probably wrong, but um, that's what well, I thought. I'll hold that because I, I, honestly, okay. I couldn't find anything on that. And if any viewers that have seen this film, if you know, comment below because I too was like, why are they there? Why I couldn't are they find there? anything the in my research. Figure. So we make it, that's what it is. We made that. We're the, we're the quintessential we review yes, of yes. this film. My story is actually the story that I like the most. It was an era of people that want to legislate morality and whether that was, you know, dancing, whether that was drinking, whether it was that, you know, having fit mothers. He tells a great story how these women are trying to get Miss Jenkins. Miss Jenkins is a almost like a spinster. Her brother is an industrialist. She has a lot of money. Band of women, dark outfits. They're in the black hats and they're not very attractive. They almost look like suffragettes type. Good. I know it. Thank you. Because I was trying to remember what suffragettes. They look exactly like suffragettes. Where she's there's a ball scene. Everyone's having a good time. They're dancing. They're eating. And she's looking around. This younger gentleman comes up to her in slight small chatter. Then he moves away, sees a younger woman, asks the younger woman to go out and dance, and then she realizes, I am too old. She looks at Her a mirror. Time and, has passed. Yeah, time has passed. As the butterfly of the men. Right. And you can get the sense that, okay, she's alone. She doesn't know what to do with herself. So 
here come the vultures and the suffragettes, I'll call them, the yeah. reformers, yeah. noting that she has a lot of money and she's also on her own. She was, they were able to convince her that their cause was just and that we need to legislate morality. So, you know, get the brother to write us a check so we can defend these, you know, types of acts of lewdness and immorality. And there's this one scene that I particularly paid attention to it was when they started to bust in on the places that were drinking, that were dancing. No dancing! No drinking, and they refer back to a scene where the police are there, they're confiscating everything, they're bringing all the people, the, the women that are dressed scantily, almost like you, you know, That's it's scant. that era, and, they, yeah. and they're going into the paddy wagon. And D.W. Griffith said something, and I want to just pull this out if I could find it quickly, because I'm not going to be able to go. There's so many damn well, I notes. I threw your notes around, too, so they're not in yeah, order, Yeah, so I'm going to paraphrase. So women that look a certain way are more attracted to reforming morality. He shows the faces of the women, and they ah, were brutes. They were yeah. ugly. El bruto. El bruto. Fracha brut. <laughs> so, and then he takes these close-ups, and then he also mentions the men. And the men are very effeminate looking. Like they're looking down on these people, like, you know, but like, oh, so you have to throw in the gays in there too. So like, I guess DW didn't like the gays either because you associated them with the reformers, the bad people. That was the best story. I think that um, because we go in each one, we'll be here for two hours. Yeah, you're right. But that was my minutes. best. I liked that. The, the, yeah, the I did best. too. And the one I liked the least was the French one. It was confusing. You really had to watch it. But maybe people that really knew French history wouldn't be able to I didn't get it the it. first time. I had to go back several times. I had times. to watch that a couple times. I did. Christ, of course, we know. We've seen it in a million movies, sure. and we, we do know. You know, the, the flashback, flash forward, back and forth between the exposition of the four stories, very, very difficult. Mm -hmm. And maybe he shouldn't have chosen four stories, maybe three, because it is, you think back, I mean... I guess people did sit, they said that people had a very hard time watching it, but what else was there to do? And they got their, like, their, their 50 cents worth or their dimes worth when they went into the theater. Well, just think how far they came from 1902, the trip to the moon, to this. It was, it was 14 amazing. years now you're doing major films, right. three and hours long Right, and I always look almost. when there's a big scene with a, a lot of people in it, I want to see if somebody in the back is laughing or they're not in character. It was like, you know, looking at ants, there were so many people in the scene. Right. And how does he direct that with a megaphone? Because that's all they had mm -hmm. to yell out on a megaphone. And by the way, three of the stories have tragic endings and one has a good ending. And that's the one with the dear one and the boy in the beginning. That's the whole thing is exonerated. They have a nice ending, but the rest are like, you know, history with fighting and wars. Forget it. Which made me think that that was going to be a bad ending. I thought, there were, I thought in that last modern scene, modern story scene, that he was going to be hanged. You're right. All the other stories had bad endings. Yeah. And then everybody... this story, and I thought they weren't going to get to him in time and he would be dead, but... They but actually... that was probably another one of his little things mm -hmm. to exonerate him from Birth of a Nation. Mm -hmm. He really was clouded by Birth of a Nation. And I think when he was making it, he didn't realize it because, of course, he was the son of a Confederate officer. Mm -hmm. And he was raised with a house with, you know, the whole slavery issues and all that stuff. And he didn't think of it. It was second nature to the people that lived down south. There was an interview with him later on in the 1930s. And he's very, he's in a tux and he's being interviewed by another gentleman in a tux and they're sitting in a very grand room and he talks about a Birth of a Nation and, you know, uh, you get a sense of what D.W. was by listening to that. Um, yeah. So I, I encourage people just to learn a little bit more about him coming from like hillbilly times and uh, very like menial existence to the, you know, such a great and you know, the funny film. thing, and I have to research this, or maybe you want to look at it because you love research so much. I don't know that there was ever a movie made about him, a narrative film about him. But I know with Cecil B. DeMille, mm -hmm. he was in Sunset Boulevard, which is one of my favorite pictures ever. He was actually himself in the movie. But these pioneers, I don't know if Mele S. even, from Trip to the Moon, if there's a, a serious picture right. made about their I lives. I don't know of any. If you know of any folks, yeah. if you know something, folks, yeah, right put it in the comments. Yeah, we'd love to, like know. to know. My costume is the effeminate Monsieur Le France. And as D.W. Griffith kindly or unkindly notes, he is the effeminate brother of the King of France. And this takes place during the days before the St. Bartholomew Day Massacre. Yeah, so I am the effeminate 
And I didn't know anything about the St. Bartholomew Massacre. Yeah, that was a serious point yeah. of history where the Catholics massacre the Huguenots, which nowadays are the Protestants. So it's a constant battle of, you know, Catholic religion versus right. Protestant religion. Um, so that's my costume today. Now, what is yours, Deborah? Um, well, I'm a queen of Babylon. It's very revealing. Our views. It is. I can't look down because yes. my beads, I was told, are hitting the mic, so I have to be very, like, staunch. And I noticed that you only have one strap. Like, are, you, are we going to have problems? Or maybe this no. will increase our subscribership and views. Yeah, yeah, yeah. like for the 75-year-old men watching. Classic cinema sips, different cocktails that represent the era in which these movies were made. So this movie was made in 1916, mm -hmm. which was before Prohibition in the United States, before the um, making alcohol illegal. And um, so this one is called the French 75. Oh, I love so, the name. So let's raise a glass. And it has another French squiggle 75. of, I know it's not the name squiggle. No, of it's a orange twist. in it. An orange twist. twist. So orange picture twist. this, 1916 in America. You're talking about the upscale American establishments. Yes. Classical music, pinkies up drinks. I can do that. Europe's at war, but we're not at war. We're right. the pacifists. So we're enjoying our lives while others are getting massacred or killed. Clink. So French 75, let's take a little sip. The name of this drink was coined after the French oh. 75 millimeter artillery weapon that was used in the First World War wow. by France, right? It's kind I of like strange. this. It's kind I can like... drink this one. Yes. So um, it became popular around 1915 in France and then caught on with the, the States. Um, it captures the elegance of sophistication because many people drank this at the upscale establishments. Well, we're very upscale. So the ingredients are one ounce of gin, a half an ounce of fresh lemon juice, Half ounce of simple syrup. Now, I have sugar issues, so I took out the simple syrup, so there's no simple syrup in this one. And added to this is some champagne or sparkling wine. So um, drink in a flute glass. Very nice. Shake up the ingredients, put it in a flute glass, top okay. it off with your champagne, and you're done. Put a little twist to it. Actually, this had a $2 million budget, mm -hmm. um, but the people didn't have the wherewithal to sit through this film. Mm -hmm. So it was recut and released as two separate films. Did you know that? The Fall of Babylon in 1919 and The Mother-in-Law in 1919. Mm -hmm. But it was the most expensive film ever made till they made 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea for $9 million. And it was, well, it was also interesting that I found that originally when he premiered it, he didn't use mm -hmm. the name, actually used a different director's name uh, said that it was an Italian film because there was an earlier film before that that came out kind of like an epic long feature film yeah. and he was afraid how people would respond to it. So yeah. that first screening was actually not used, didn't use the name Intolerance, didn't use his name. Fair reception and then he put it out. Right. With his name. So um, one, one thing he did was, and I, I don't know if you touched on it before Joe and another show, he mastered the close-up and he stressed the facial expression of the person with the main actors. Yep. And most directors were still using wide shots and not doing face, you know, close-ups. Mm -hmm. And they never concentrated on the anguish or the light of the star's face. Right. So he was known for that close-up. The man who played Christ was deported after the movie in a sex scandal, mm -hmm. and his name was removed from the credits. That's how serious they were about things. Mm -hmm. I mean, justice was done, whether you were put in jail or you were taken out of a movie. Mm -hmm. They didn't fool around. You did something. You were done. Like Fatty Arbuckle, mm -hmm. who was a silent film star. Now, he had a terrible scandal because one time he was, and he, he's a lot of interesting silent movies. His stuff is kind of hard to find. Mm -hmm. To have very heavy actor, but like comedic. Right. And they had something where they had a girl one night and they had glass bottles and drinking and she died. And that was it. He was a, one of the hugest silent film stars. Next day, non-existent. Here's Joe's thing. After looking through pages and pages of notes, here it is. Your printer uh, must need new ink now. every week. Okay. True or false? 
There were multiple script revisions for Intolerance, so much so that the main actors would receive daily revisions on the morning that they were scheduled to act. True or false? Well, I'm going to guess. Go. Um, I say true. You're wrong! It's false! I'm wrong? Is that the first time I've been wrong? D.W. Griffith had so many notes and changes that he would just tell the actors what to do and how to act as filming went on. Well, I have to go back and study more, Joe. Maybe I need as many notes as you do. Or maybe you need some more of these drinks. Yeah, we need more drinks. drinks. Yep. Don't go to sleep. Number one, 1920. Ooh. No, come on. Like <laughs> Three Stooges. You listen to the, these are good films. Now just stop it. Okay. Just stop go, it go. because I won't tolerate your intolerance right. of my watch I'll list. keep my mouth shut by eating my nuts. Okay, eat your nuts. I don't want them. I ate two of your nuts <laughs> already. <laughs> That's enough. <laughs> okay, please. This is very serious for me. <laughs> Teaching people something so learn. <laughs> okay, number one. Oh, stop. Oh, please. 1920, The Mark of Zorro. A seemingly idiotic fop is really the courageous vigilante Zorro who seeks to protect the oppressed. Starring Douglas Fairbanks Sr., who is athletic and leaping about. It was remade four times, believe it or not. And the most famous remake was RKO's heartthrob Tyrone Power. Ben-Hur, A Tale of Christ, 1925. A Jewish prince seeks to find his family and revenge himself upon his childhood friend who had him wrongly imprisoned. Starring Ramon Navarro, who was actually gay and was killed by two men he invited into his house when he was older. Brothers. It was remade at least five times with the most significant remake being Ben-Hur of 1959, which is my favorite picture before 1960. And my father, I'm going to just inject this. My father was a stand-in for Ramon Navarro in the oh. original Ben-Hur. My father would have been in his hundreds now. The Sheik, 1921. A charming Arabian Sheik becomes infatuated with an adventurous, modern-thinking English woman and abducts her to his home in the Sahara Desert. Women favorite Latin lover Rudolf Valentino. He died from a ruptured gastric ulcer at his last film's premiere. 80,000 mourners were at his funeral in New York City. And he held another funeral in L.A., and he was a real bodice ripper. You know what that means? No clue. Women tore their bodices off when they saw him. And he actually created the fame of the movie magazine, the first star in movie magazines for women that they went nuts for him. Yeah, but he was gay. City Lights, a feel-good romance from Charlie Chaplin, silent film's most well-known film star. With the aid of a wealthy erratic tippler, a dewy-eyed tramp who has fallen in love with a sightless flower girl, accumulates money to be able to help her medically. And I also want them to check out F.W. Murnau's films, as well as Harold Lloyd, Buster Keaton, Lon Chaney Sr., and Sunday Night Silence on Turner Classic Movies with the host Jacqueline Stewart. And I could go on forever about silent movies. You can. Well, it, that, yeah. That was a long one. That was as long as Intolerance. I know. It really <laughs> was. So, Debbie, I enjoyed the movie. I slept through the movie. I woke up to the movie. But at the end of the day, I'm probably not going to watch it again. No. Nah. But I did learn a lot from it. We and know I think, so much. I think, Our heads. So, for Intolerance, you know... Watch it, learn from it, and then watch something from Debbie's Watches. Because all these cards right now, I don't want them anymore. They're done. No, I... Oh. So, Debbie, where are we going next? Joe, I'll tell you once, I'll tell you twice, I'll tell you a hundred times. We never know where we're going until we go there.